welcome all of you okay to this open class of the international master in sustainable development and corporate responsibility and of course welcome all the people who is following it by by streaming just for the people who do not know us just uh, to mention that this class is part of an exchange program with the school of business and leadership at university of kwazulu natal in South Africa and concretely will be focused on South Africa business and development. Okay, the session will be conducted by Lida Stott who is the International Master in Sustainable Development Corporate Responsibility Director at EOI. So thank you very much and enjoy the session. Thank you, you Almudena. We're really delighted this morning to have our guests from South Africa. As Almudena has said, they're from the Graduate School of Business and Leadership at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, quite a prestigious university in South Africa based in the city of Durban. And what they're going to do is talk to us this morning a little bit about South Africa so you understand the general context of the country and where the conversation about business is coming from. So we're going to start with Bakatsile Dlamine, who um, is a student, a master student in local economic development. She will be followed by Nolwazi Mtembu, who will, is also a student um, on the master's program in local economic development. And Stan will be accompanying them, uh, contributing during their conversations and answering your questions which uh, we will take towards the end of the presentation. Uh, Stan, just so you know, is a senior lecturer in regional and economic development and has worked extensively in South Africa on relationships between business and education. So I think we're in for a very exciting morning. Back at Sili, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Lida. Um, as she has said, my name is Baketile Lamini. Um, normally, I just love to be called BK. It's easy to remember. Um, so, start to stand here. <coughs> there we go. Is there an issue? No. Is it the one? Is there a female? No, okay. Um, <coughs> okay. As Lila said, I'm just going to talk, uh, give a talk about South Africa. South Africa is in the southern part of Africa. It is, um, I've just put a title there and said a development state. And it is a development state. If you know South Africa, the history that it has um, in terms of apartheid and where it is now and where it's going. Um, first, I'll just chat about what is where South Africa and what is South Africa all about, just to give you an idea. And Nolwazi will then get into the business stuff of how South Africa does business. Um, as I've said, that South Africa is in the southern part of Africa. It is, um, as you can see, it has nine provinces and we are, this is us. Um, we come from Durban and it has nine provinces which are spread all over the country. Um, and something to, to, to just highlight, this is where I come from, Swaziland. Um, Nolwazi said yesterday that it is in South Africa, but you see we still have a border of Mozambique, so <laughs> kind of 80% there. Um, South Africa is a country that, if you talk about Africa, people always focus on South Africa. It's a country that is well known because of the interaction with the world that has happened. Um, it is somehow when you get to South Africa, you do feel that you're in South Africa, then there's Africa. But we're changing all of that. We're changing that mindset because of it being a developmental state and a state that's looking into getting itself more into the global, you know, the global world. Um, languages. Um, I've said that we have nine provinces within the country. We have 12 official languages in, in, in South Africa. And you find that depending where you are, people will speak a bit of this, a bit of that. And that is mainly in Johannesburg, which is one of the big cities in um, South Africa. When you get to Johannesburg, people speak all sorts of languages because it's more of like um, a central 
you know, a central part where most people flock into. If you've got foreigners, mostly they find in Johannesburg or in Cape Town. Okay, um, Johannesburg also is a city that is fast growing, is a city that's where all the activity is happening. If you want to be in business, you start off in Joburg because that's where business activities is, in, is very big in, in South Africa. Um, in terms of the culture, South Africa is, is very diverse. Um, there is an image that I will show you to explain what I mean when I say South Africa is very diverse. Um, also, to get into the global that South Africa is hoping, well, is a, a global player. Um, Nolwazi will touch more onto that. Um, and I also, okay, just to talk about something that is very important to me as a young person is the youth active participation. As I've said yesterday, I am uh, a person that comes from a very small country, which is Swaziland. And youth in Swaziland don't really have a voice when it comes to engaging in terms of politics, in terms of policy making, in terms of it, basically anything. The engagement that we have is more on <coughs> really limited. I can't even really think. But the way we engage is, is we participate. Um, we, we, we kind of say something along the lines where there is some, maybe there's some demonstrations, then we'll participate. But we normally don't have that. The country is run through a monarchy, which means the king runs everything. The government is run by the elderly, you know, and the youth kind of participate through lobbying, but not as much. But in South Africa, it is different. Um, participation of the youth has changed. Government has now, you'll find that you have got younger councillors. Um, Rima, yes, you said that you want to be a councillor. Yes, politics, yes. Um, yeah, so now you find that in South Africa, you've got younger councillors, you've got younger people getting into, um, into politics, you've got younger people having influence um, in terms of policy making, in terms of agenda setting and implementing that policy. You also have younger people who now have big businesses that are influencing the policy and how it's implemented. So the youth participation is getting bigger and it's getting very, very, very aggressive now in the sense that more youth now have a voice. Um, we have quite a, a number of political parties, but one of the prominent one, which is the ANC, which is the African National Congress, they've got a youth um, segment from it and it's been very vocal. So the youth participation in terms of politics is very big now. And in terms of business, more people have business which are very young, you know, which are fall in the youth category, which is very interesting now. Um, in terms of the education system, um, as someone that came from another country and then went into, into South Africa, it was quite interesting to see the involvement of the education system, which has influenced how business is operated. More people now are finding themselves that are, are educated, but there's no employment, and people are now getting into entrepreneurship. So there is that shift. A lot of, uh, previously it was, you get a degree, you get a job, life goes on. Now it's more about you get a degree, no job, but you make a plan. And there is that platform for you to make a plan. We've got organizations that allow you to get in there as a young person. You can borrow money, start your own business, you know, get into cooperatives. I don't know if cooperatives is a normal term, but yeah, get into cooperatives, start off businesses. There's more of youth social entrepreneurship that's looming up. There's more of just you know, the mainstream entrepreneurship that's looming up from the youth participation. So the education system has allowed people to, the way it is, has forced people into moving into different directions, which is not more traditional to what it was before. Okay, that is South Africa. <laughs> Um, it is known, is this, it's known as the rainbow nation. Why? Because every skin color or race is there. In terms of, um, you, if you can see the image, we've got categories, we've got four categories. We've got the Indians, we've got coloreds, we've got blacks, and we've got whites. And we all exist 
in this one place. So you can imagine the diversity in terms of language, in terms of how to respond. There's certain things that you can't say. Um, I was sharing with Lida yesterday that, you know, you, you, we normally have these race jokes that you do and also depends where you are you can just say it I can just say oh no it's a black thing and people will find that funny or you say oh it's a white thing but there's certain context because of the history of this apartheid there's certain things the diversity that has limited us to engage freely but also has given us the opportunity to speak for us, to speak out. So people now um, are engaging. The black community is now having more businesses. We've got something that's called the BE, which is um, the broadband black empowerment, which allows black businesses to strive um, to do well or to exist within the same context as the white business. Um, most probably some of you won't understand if I put it like this, but in South Africa, white, black, Indian was very distinctive in terms of where they stayed, how they existed, and their participation and education. Um, there was a time where, as a black person, you can't go to a school that is, is in a white neighborhood, or you can't stay in an area that's dedicated for white people. But now that has changed. I can wake up in the morning go to any tertiary that I want to, go to any school that I want to, if I can afford it. So that has been amazing to look at the history of South Africa and where it comes from. And now we're at a position where, as I've said, I can just, even people from other nations are able just to get into a university and participate, and even participate in terms of the politics. So now you find that parliament is well represented companies are well represented so but also there are places where that's not in existence and it's still evidence racial comments are still there um, racism is still in existence we can't you know move away from that but it is something that is changing okay famous man um, how many know Nelson Mandela of course, everyone knows Nelson Mandela. Um, I'm not going to go into in terms of who this man is. We all know who he is. We know he's a special guy. We know he's a Nobel Prize winner. We know all of that. But in terms of South Africa, in terms of the film industry, which is I thought was very interesting, um, there's a movie that just came out, um, The Long Walk to Freedom by Nelson Mandela. It is very interesting. But it also, what it's done is, it has just opened up South Africa into the world, for the world to understand and see the journey that Nelson Mandela, this Nelson Mandela, because most people just know him as a humanitarian and all of that, but don't know the struggle, the real struggles that he went through. So it just shows the journey that South Africa um, traveled with this man, and as a nation, how far you've w we've got in terms of understanding and in terms of acceptance. That's what the movie is trying to say. Um, obviously, this is my interpre uh, interpretation, and other people may see it differently, but I've seen it as just a tool that has been put out there to say, okay, this is what we went through, but this is where we want to go, and through that, money's coming in. Um, okay, um, Lida has said that I'm going to just talk about South Africa and what I've done is I've just given you an overview about what South Africa is all about. I know I've just mumbled and mumbled, but what I was trying to do is it's just trying to give you a picture that, okay, this is South Africa, this is where it is, and this is where it's, it's, it's hoping to, to go. And Nolwazi will obviously give you a more in-depth understanding of how business plays into this. Um, Lida said that I'm also a master's student and he had asked us to kind of um, bring my thesis um, into, you know, into life and explain how as an economic development practitioner, um, <laughs> um, yeah, so my master's thesis is about social capital and I think, and, and this is my thinking, and, and I think it's such a beautiful, beautiful theory to work with. Um, if we yesterday we spoke about business, we said business, um, business means social. And that's what social capital means. It means let us start moving into building 
different networks, building relationship, creating trust in order for us to have a better civil society, a better government system that works well for business and brings us, you know, that whole partnerships comes together. And this, I believe, will able to do that. Um, it is something that talks about diversity. It talks about sense of belonging. It talks about um, participation, which I know Lida and I've, re and I've I mean, I've re referenced so many of her papers on participation, which is exciting and what we're hoping to have as a nation, like as a country, as the world. Participation has become so important in, in, in forming different, you know, links with different companies, um, different organizations. So I think social capital is something that we ought to make use of. We ought to start looking depth into and how to bring into every situation. It applies in business, it applies in government, civil society. It is something that we can start using. Um, as an LED practitioner, what I did is LED is local economic development. Um, what I've done is I, I took this and I took it to the streets. So I literally went out to different communities in a specific um, district within KwaZulu-Natal. And I first said, what is social capital? Do people understand this? Um, and I started having conversation. And in my research, what I did is I spoken, I, I tried to look at um, local economic development practitioners who just wake up in the morning, change lives, in order to do that, they do it through business, through engagement, or through some social activity. And what I did is I had a cup of community people from people that own spazas. I don't know if you guys know spazas. Spazas are like your small grocery shop in your local area, very local, very small, in a small container. But that guy brings so much income and it rotates. And that's what I wanted to see. Because local economic development talks about expanding within your locality. So making business work within your locality. So what you have, you buy it local, you sell it local to the local people. So that's what I wanted to understand, that can this work to a normal guy that owns a little grocery shop? And I have thoughts around that. Um, and my thinking was based on a man named Robert Putman. He is um, a, a very interesting public policy man. And I had the pleasure, thanks to my lecturer, um, you know how we, we reference um, authors with our journal articles and our masters and our, and we never really get the opportunity to actually engage with these authors. I mean, we read their stuff and we think they, um, their writing is amazing, like great thoughts, but we never really get the opportunity to actually, you know, have a conversation with them. I mean, these are big guys. So who am I all the way in little Swaziland in South Africa? And I emailed them. I uh, googled him, thanks to Google. I googled him, I searched for him, hey, so many pages. And finally, I got his email address and I popped him an email. I said, hey, uh, my name is Makisile Lamini. I'm doing my masters, masters of commerce. Social capital is my thing. I think it's a beautiful thing, but I haven't read so many papers that link us to Africa because I'm all about context. That's me. Anything I read, I must be able to apply it to my context. It must work for my context. If it doesn't, then it's not worth me reading. So I said, I'm not finding anything. And I said, you know, I've been reading your work. And then I did the mistake of start quoting him. I'm like, Oh. When I read the email, I'm like, I'm quoting the same man that I'm reading. Oh, okay, never mind. But you'll see that I've read his stuff. So I started saying, okay, I've read your paper, I've read on this. And so do you have any? And he said, this fellow, again, my name kind of, when you see my name, you think I'm a guy. Well, I've gotten used to it. So he says, um, I don't have links in terms of papers or anything in terms of Africa, but I've got a guy that I will link you up to. So he was started linking me up to some other author and and then when he responded back and he gave me a list of authors and journal articles to look up that could link up to my study three of them had reference I'm like <laughs> I'm on the right path and it was so interesting and we had a discussion and I even started inviting him or pushing my luck for him to come to Africa and just do a guest lecture at my school so that just gave a whole different dimension for me in terms of my study. It became my life. I met the guy that, you know, who I think is the father of social capital in terms of email and the correspondence. Um, here. Yeah. Okay. 
So that's what he says. I mean, he says, suggests that um, social capital provides the key to healthy communities. This author maintains that while the definition of social capital is the subject of much debate, it is generally understood to refer to trust-based networks. Like, it was such an aha moment for me when I read that. But what, what it said to me was that the study can become alive because trust is there, but it's hard to trust when you're dealing with government because my other counterpart, as I was dealing with local communities, I was also dealing with the local government. So the minute you say trust and you're talking about government, that just gets thrown out the window. And the response that I got from my research in terms of when I was looking at the trust-based issues, the community members responded and they said, it's respect, it's not trust. The only thing that we have when we have to work with these people is just out of respect. We don't trust them. And why would we bring trust into this? It's local government. But, and, and, and I started unpacking that thinking with them because, as I've said, I had conversations. My, 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 my research, um, the way I did my study, the way I collected my data, I didn't do interviews. I literally sat with them. So I said, tell me about yourself. Tell me about your business. We're really conversation because I wanted to get more out of, because we, you know, when you're doing interviews, it's like question, answer, question, answer, and it gets so, you know, restricted. But with this, it was more conversational, which assisted me in understanding better what community is all about and the engagement that they have with regards to other LED practitioners. Um, yeah, so what, I'd also, what also came out of the study was um, this person, Maya Stemmer, she, what she does is she said, in terms of explaining what LED, because I go back, I said LED to me is all about making it contextual. So it has to work in the context that I'm in. So I said, she said, like, it's a process in which partnerships between local government, the private and the community is established to uh, manage local and access to external resources to stimulate the economy. I thought, whoa, that is just too much. That is too much for the community that I'm working with. When I started um, unpacking there, also their understanding of local economic development is, I saw that wait a minute, these people are more focused on community economic development, which is different. They get resources from the municipality to start the business. They operate the business in a municipal-owned building, so they don't pay rent. So whatever money they get, it's more on in their pocket, and that's it. They don't pay rent, so they're making the money, but where is the engagement? So I started um, shifting, trying to just make them think around saying, okay, you're operating as community economic development. How do you see yourself operating as local economic development, as local economic drivers? Because right now, you've got your own little shop and you're engaging with the people that you, you, uh, within your locality, but it's not making money for your people. So... These were my final thoughts. Um, what is important, I saw that, to note about the research study was that participation of local community in LED initiatives is vital. LED has, is to, it talks about inclusive participation, talks about different stakeholders coming together. It will not be LED if there aren't any different stakeholders participating. I also say that considering that there are numerous shortcomings associated with improving LED, how is it implemented within the Elemba district, which is the, my context area that I was working in, is a positive intervention by the municipal authorities. When I had a chat with the um, local government, their thinking was that we provide service, they receive the service, we provide infrastructure, and they have to respond to us. So it's not the other way around. But the engagement, when I started discussing with them, they started seeing the difference in operating in a more inclusive manner. Start thinking as local community, as agents of change, as people that worth discussing matters with, as people worth um, sharing and, and, and start, you know, start implementing the policy 
together, start thinking together and how, okay, this is our community. How best can we bring in investment? What does the community need? How can we change? Okay, we need a building. Can we come together? So it's all about, they started seeing it, oh, oh, okay. So it should be about inclusiveness more than us standing here and saying, okay, as a community, this is what we'll provide and this is what you'll receive. And that's it. Um, the context as, uh, that I was working in is more rural. So the engagement also, I had issues of language. I had issues of trying to make the terminology understandable to, you know, to the level of education of the people that I was, you know, as I said, I was having conversations with. So I had to move away from the master's thinking, master's student, to... Hey, okay, so LED, so LED is this and that, trying to put myself in their shoes. And that allowed me to become one of them. So when I had the, the interviews and, you know, the conversations, they'll give me food, you know, have a drink and, you know, have local food just to welcome me. And for them, then they started unpacking this whole thing that I was hoping to find. So it was interesting to do that and be able to understand that local community operate differently from local government or from any urban, you know, local communities. They are very different, but they're not different in terms of how they make money. Everyone at the end of the day needs to bring something to the table. So it was also that was a learning curve for me. Um, as part of um, the, the, the whole program that we are in, what we do as, 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 as leader has said that we, we, we're from a university of KwaZulu Natal, Graduate School of Business, and what we've done is we've teamed up with government, which is quite interesting for a university. We've teamed up with government and we said, okay, we want to start working in the province, we want to start making a change, and how are we going to do that? We're going to do that through research. And how are we going to do that? Youth participation. The youth now are going to come out and they're going to start doing research, start producing case studies that are going to be used within the tertiary and within government. Case studies that talk about what's happening in the province, case studies that give us an indication of where the problem is, where can the solution be, and where can we source the solution from. And this is what we do. This is our young researchers program that comes, it's different individuals that come from different contexts in terms of their edu education background. We have people that did development, engineering, um, economics, law, that come together into this program and we go out and we do research. And after that research, we say, okay, these are the case studies we've come out with and this, as, this is us trying to say, this is what the community wants. This is what's out there. This is the reality. And that's this program. These are young people um, coming from all sorts of life that just come together and try and make change. Thank you. Thank you very much, BK. I think that was really interesting. What we'll do is take questions at, um, after Nolwazi's uh, presentation and then maybe we can tie the, the two talks together if that's okay. So Nolwazi. Okay. I've Let me just um, which one is my which one? This one. What was BK using? How do I do that? Just go down. Okay, cool. Okay, um, hi guys. Uh, I'm literally just going to take over from where BK had left off. Um, although she left it a bit at the social capital, but I'll try putting it together. So I'll look at... Um, 
the challenges that South Africa faces, right, and in particular the developmental challenges and going a bit into how um, business is, is, is actually trying to address these challenges. Um, okay, so let's start off by identifying these challenges, right. Um, of course, South Africa being the country that it is, we can name a lot of challenges that they um, face um, in developing the country as a whole. But in research and in a lot of papers and, uh, and insights that we'll you know, read into, there's three that seem to dominate the, um, the conversation, um, and that being poverty, inequality, and unemployment. Okay, now before I even go into depth with those three, I just wanted to share that um, a South African author and a journalist um, wrote a book on how to overcome Africa's challenges and highlighting, you know, by highlighting some of the other challenges that, um, yes, may overlap with the three that I mentioned, but are very also um, important to understanding the whole context of South Africa's developmental process and the hinders and, and so forth. So, I mean, he speaks about the negative trends in the SA economy. I'll touch a bit on that, but just to give you a bit of an understanding, um, South Africa's economy has literally gone from point A to uh, a point Z from um, a lot of people's perspectives. Because, yes, with the apartheid, um, a lot has changed. So a lot of the actors that are currently involved in the economy of South Africa now were probably not even allowed to even be engage, engage in any form of um, economical um, you know, engagement to the level that they are currently right now. So we see a lot of trends such as, um, you know, prior, pre-1994 uh, in apartheid areas, the main, uh, the high economic actors were, you know, dominating white males um, who could necessarily be that. And now you see a shift in post-1994, we see a shift to, you know, black males and, and also with the female context also coming into, into play, both um, white and black. So there's a lot going on there. The class formation and the rising inequalities of SA. Class formation, um, I think it's just something that's always been there. Um, and when we look at the different classes, because of the nature of apartheid and how segregation led to a lot of, dif excuse me, a lot of different piling up of class, uh, classes and discriminations of various you know, groups and so on. Um, a class formulated, right? So we have the high class, which will be your your elite um, people with, um, you know, who are heavily active within the economy, um, and then you'll have your middle class, which is the largest. And I think, uh, and this is pretty much dominant in many uh, countries alike. Um, and then we have our our bottom line, which is massive, right? So that's an inequality in its own. Um, the people, the poorest of the poor, are extremely poor, and the rich are ex extremely rich, leaving the middle um, parts. I, I, I tend to, to say that there is no middle part in South Africa. You either fall, you know, I, I think there's, we can separate the, the, the rich to two and the poor into two, but I can't seem to, to be sold on the idea that we have a middle class. I don't know. Um, it's it's a, a debate that we can go on about, but anyways. Um, our education system, uh, a mere disaster, <laughs> to say the least. Um, and again, our really good uh, schools are private schools, which tend to lend into, um, you know, teachings from various other countries. Um, so, I mean, like our exams, um, final years will be taken from, you know, countries all over the world, whereas our public education, which is most accessible to um, our country, is just appalling. Um, so that's a major, major, major crisis in, in South Africa in terms of the development of the country, because we're not producing people at a level um, that in the required level to actually compete globally, um, intellectually and, you know, uh, alongside. Entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is a very important um, aspect to, to my um, intellectual thinking when, we, when I look at development. Because um, I think 
enterprise development is a very important um, tool to use in getting people to understand where they fit within the economy, where they fit within making a difference within their development of their personal development and the development of um, their locality and their country as a whole. Um, and I think entrepreneurship is a very good you know, vehicle in doing that, taking into consideration that the people that we produce in South Africa um, are not really at a high standard that they can do a lot of those special skills. Although, yes, I'm not saying we don't have anyone who can do any of those, you know, amazing stuff. We've got amazing mathematicians. We've got amazing engineers. We've got all of that, but not to the demand that the country needs, uh, you know, to meet the demand that the country has. Our health as well. Our health system is... Although it's caught on to, uh, it, they've found the bag, the you, you know the bandwagon. Um, we've identified that we need health, some sort of a health insurance um, mechanism, which a lot of countries have actually adapted to and has, has worked very well. Um, like, uh, so yes, the country has, which which is something that I really like. We've adapted to what Mauritius. Um, has done and although Mauritius is, is at a smaller scale to South Africa but I think that's where the country needs to be looking at and we're currently the, we, we're, we're on that stage currently looking at that so um, you know yes we have free health in terms of we have clinics in, in our rural areas and South Africa is made up of 40, 46% of South Africa is made up of rural areas and the rest is urban and within that urban we have townships which probably make up about um, an extra 30% of it and the townships, townships, we understand townships? Okay, great. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I don't want to go back into that. Corruption, I had to put that there, I didn't really want to put it there but um, I'd be failing the whole the ideal situation. Um, yes, corruption in South Africa is a major situation. Um, politics within uh, business and within civil society uh, as a whole. So uh, it's everywhere and it tends to hinder the development of the country um, majorly because um, as much as I think, I think our ruling party, and I also s I stand to be corrected, our ruling party has you know, policies that could actually create some sort of drastic change within our country and its economy but because of that little thing we aren't moving at the pace that we should be um, and a regional regional integration I like that because I'm very much into learning from other people and and working together um, to better create the you know the areas in which we're in we don't even Within South Africa as a whole, our regional, regional integration, which Mulebezi um, Mbegi speaks about so uh, greatly. I haven't even finished reading his book, but um, <laughs> he, he picks this up so, so elegantly. Um, the concept of blending into your neighbors and understanding what your neighbors have and what, um, whatever they have and how it can help you as a locality and a country, right? A province, even you know, just minimizing it to the small lengths and stop working as a unit. I mean, as a you know, uh, a sole unit, and we need to start working together. And um, you know, the African Union is is trying to push that a lot. Um, and as you know, the African Union is is actually chaired by um, a South African. So I, I think one of her main um, goals is to try and bring this up, you know, and bring it with within South Africa as a whole. Okay, so I hope you're still with me. With me? Okay. So pre-1994, right? Um, poverty, what was it? What was the status at, right? So at least 58% of all South Africans and 68% of all African um, uh, and Africans in South Africa, the population was in poverty. Okay, sorry, what am I saying? At least 58% of all South Africans and 68% of the African population was in poverty in 1990, yeah, 1995, right? So that was just taking into consideration what the situation was pre-1995, right? Okay, now while poverty was virtually non-existent for white, that was just how things went, right? The white people in South Africa, like, you'd never find a white beggar. Never. And even now, 
post-1994, seeing a white beggar is, is still a bit of a, it's a shock. It, it's, there's a lot to it. And it, it could just be well, my personal experience um, to that as well. It's just something that's um, still a bit far from being a norm. Okay, now inequality. The Guinea index of the income uh, distribution was recorded at a 0 0.69, so making South Africa one of the most unequal countries in the world, which is not a shock. Um, now, the country also inherited a vast inequality in education, as I was saying, the health and the basic infrastructure. Now, with the basic infrastructure, this is very important because um, BK touched upon the, the, the infrastructure uh, uh, segregation, if you may. So, we had the cities, like the C CBDs, um, and that's where everything went on, right? The economy of the, 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 the cities. The cities basically was vested ar around the, the CBDs. Now, what they did with the, the black community and the Indians was they put them on the far, you know, the outskirts of these CBDs, making it hard for them to travel into these cities and, and to even just be around it, right? Um, yeah, so we still... And a lot of the, the development that's going on right now is the developing of these particular townships and these particular areas that, um, you know, the mass population is situated in because it's such a big shift to actually just try and bring the whole, um, the whole townships in, right? So what happens is a lot of the development, so infrastructure development, uh, building of buildings and trying to get the townships as a, an attractive, you know, place for for you know, people to come and work for foreign, um, you know, direct investments and uh, a lot of um, just trying to get a more dispersed and, and, and diverse nature within the, the spread of the um, economic activity. Um, yes, we still have, um, within the rural areas now, um, I think within, if, if our rural areas are at a percentage of 46%, currently now, I think I read something was July and the, the percentage was um, about 38% of rural areas that, uh, that exist within South Africa still don't have water, running water, right? So they have a tap, but it will be from, so if this was our place, the tap would be at the main entrance of this particular building. It wouldn't be within my particular area. So that's a bit of a situation. And sanitation as well. So we, so what, uh, another thing that happened was because of um, the situations in the rural areas and a lot of the, the, the people of color were living far from the cities, right? You'd have a lot of people um, who couldn't afford you know, transportation from from their particular homesteads to the city would then try make a means to an end and create like a we call them shacks and in Isisul we'd call them imjondolo. Um and these would basically be homes built out of anything they could find that could, you know, be made into a home. Um, so anything, and, and those pretty much went, and I'll show you a picture a bit later on, you know, how that is, and it just happened like that. Um, so in, in a, in pre-1994, and possibly now, but not, not to a major extent, a lot of the male figures would leave their homes, well, families in the rural areas, and travel to Johannesburg to go work in the mines, right? Now, what would happen there is they'd leave a home, a wife and, f and kids, in rural KZN, and they'd go into urban, you know, uh, Johannesburg to go and work. They'd then start a, you know, small family in Johannesburg as well, and they'd build up this um, home. So this guy would literally have two families um, that they'd... Um, be taken care of. Now, pre-1994, while only one out of four Africans had access to piped water um, into their houses, like, as I was saying, Asians and whites um, had complete access to all of this, right? And, yeah, well, you know, a sad thing that, that's happening in South Africa now is as the, the, the African community is, is, is getting 
more exposed and is able now to actually live in, in the suburban areas and live luxury lives that they could never afford to or could never have been allowed to do so, a lot of the, the whites and Asians are moving to various other countries. And, and those are we find that those are the ones who, who are still stuck in the apartheid, you know, <laughs> and I probably shouldn't even say that, but yeah, they just can't get past that ideology of the white people just should be separate from people of color. Um, so sad reality. Unemployment. Now, in 2013, unemployment rate was estimated at 24.7%, which um, this was in the third quarter, so the current quarter that we're in now. And it's actually decreased from 256 from the second quarter of this year, which is actually very, very good. Um, I think about last, when LIDA came, it was at about 26 and we were saying that it's pretty much the same as Spain at that particular time. <laughs> so we've actually done well. <laughs> Just putting it out there. <laughs> um, yeah, so since 1995, we've actually um, oh, decreased, not increased, I meant decreased, has steadily decreased since um, 1995 if we're looking at the unemployment rate, right? making South Africa's unemployment rate amongst the highest in the world. Still, we still are amongst the highest, even at that particular percentage. Now, many countries in rural SA have little economic activity to even speak of. And going back to what I was saying, um, you know, a lot of... And another sad thing that I, I cannot miss out, and I'm going to touch on it a, a bit later, is uh, a young... Uh, I'm 25 years old, um, and I... <laughs> <laughs> um, and I live in, well, I grew up in a township, but um, my parents have a, a, a home in, in, in suburban areas, right? So I'd be classified as a privileged South, a black South African, right? Um, as opposed to someone who grew up in a rural area, my age, same person my age, um, and has no alternative to higher education or, or anything else, right? Now, what the government has tried to do for that particular person, right? So for me, they would try to give me access to furthering my education, giving, um, you know, giving me an opportunity to uh, maybe study abroad or even just get a job, right? What they've been doing for uh, the 25-year-old in the rural area is developing their skills, right? So if that person cannot directly get access to a high education, so many different reasons, she's probably hasn't, she probably hasn't finished her matric, or if she has finished it, she didn't do very well to actually be accepted into um, a tertiary institution. They de develop her skill, a skill, right? So <laughs> anything, uh, uh, that's another thing that, I feel a bit strongly about, but I won't go into that. But going back to my um, my point is, she would be encouraged to get into agriculture, right? She's got the land. They've probably got oh, hectares of, of land within her her home, you know, stead, and she is encouraged to make use of that particular land, which is probably being used by her mother, who is 75 years old, got a backache now, um, not 75, man, being 60 years old, 60 years old, um, has a backache now because she's literally gotten her income from this particular, you know, agricultural space. So that young person who probably has two children by now um, hasn't got a matric uh, certificate would still think that farming is beyond her, right? And the government is just trying to change the perceptions and the ad ideology of what agriculture could mean to them, right? So thinking about it as a business as opposed to, oh, just another thing that gets us food on the table, right? Um, which is a, a major challenge that government is trying to overcome. And I think we still have a long way to go there because it's more of a mindset than anything else, right? Okay. 
now infrastructure right now what happened was um with the with the party finishing and all of that right people so the guy who left the, his family in rural kzn came to work in the mines right built up their shack and i'll show you another picture built up a shack in this uh, Soweto or somewhere. Now the government is trying to get rid of all those particular, uh, you know, informal settlements, informal houses, and giving them houses like that, right? Which is part of the reconstruction and development program. They called RDP houses. So it would be about a four-room house with what, what running water, electricity, and somewhat, um, and that's currently what it is. Now, funny enough. Um, in I was in Dubai about two months ago, and the guy that we were with was telling us about oh how the government is giving RDP houses to people in Dubai, and he was showing me like the the houses this particular house like type of houses, and I was failing to see what house he was showing me because all I could see were these double story houses. I'm thinking which ones? <laughs> are those? <laughs> I'm like okay, so. Yes, we may be seen as back, uh, you know, uh, a bit backwards from the world, but those particular infrastructural developments are working, right? They may not be the f where we should end off. I mean, there's there's a lot more that can be done in in in, in that sphere, but that's what the government is currently doing. The agriculture, <coughs> again, so that's what government is trying to push as an alternative, right, for um, the particular people. I'm trying to think why I put that picture there. Did I say labor unions? Oh. But anyways, okay. Um, trade, <laughs> well, yeah, labor unions. I don't know why I put that there. But okay, um, interesting enough is Spain going through a lot of demonstrations, right? Um, various different things, and it's normally a, a probably a quiet march to from point A to point B. Am I right? Would it be a lot of okay? Now South Africans are very verbal and um, very active. Like right here would be your typical demonstration, but they'd have more things in their hands. They'd probably demolish more stuff, and it's just. <laughs> yes, um, I don't know what I wanted to say with that. Oh, goodness. Okay, and again, just trying to give you a perspective of what I'm talking about with, the, with all these different things. I mean, the capital formation and the share of the GDP from 1960 to 2010 looks like that. So as much as, you know, that particular point in time, was representative of a smaller group of South Africans. Now with the larger people, well, with the larger group in play, we've still found a decrease, right? And, and that's where South Africa gets a lot of its criticism from. Um, so yes, we've got a long way to go, although we are now moving, moving up. And even within the you know, economic crisis, that was, I should have gotten something a bit more recent, but you get the feel. Okay, now I'm, I'm just going to use three case studies referencing how business is trying to tackle these challenges, right? My first case study is a chamber of commerce, right, in KZN. I've worked a lot with this particular chamber, so hence I've decided to talk about it. But chambers are, are seen as a place where business within a region can come together and access a variety of different um, networks, uh, f for me like a, a, a home for business, right? And that's pretty much what's what this chamber has done. And this chamber is actually about three years old now, but it's managed to, it actually won Chamber of, of the Year, South African Chamber of the Year, last year, right? Yeah, last year because of its, its dynamic approach to these challenges, developmental challenges. Now, for example, um, 
it's one of the only chambers that's actually just gone straight up to um, trying to address unemployment in the, in the manner that it has. Now, for a chamber to start up a program, um, what they did is they opened up a competition because one of their three main aims was to identify, or not even identify, to, to curb the inequalities within the area that they live in, right? Understanding that Belito, where this particular chamber is situated, was a white, white dominated, um, you know, elite class area. You wouldn't find um, even a middle class black person living in Belito, you know, probably about 10 years ago, or no, probably a bit more. Yeah, maybe even 10 years ago, right? Well, yeah, pretty much. But what they've done is they've identified um, the potential that business people or, or small businesses have within the outskirts area. So if you see this as you know, a central town, and remember we spoke about the dispersed um, townships. Yeah. So what they've done is they've said, um, we actually want to give these particular township business people an opportunity to actually come and, and do you know, business with the elite. Right, so a competition where we would identify these people, put them into um, a situation where we'd develop them, um, develop their business plans and all of that, and give them membership into this particular chamber, so that one they are part of a an elite chamber um, membership. Right, so two, when investments come in or when an opportunity arises for their particular business, they are there within the know, they're there to receive or to be an option as opposed to um, them now running after a particular, uh, don't want to go into it, but yeah. So what they've done is they said they wanted to strengthen and create entrepreneurship and decrease um, unemployment because yes, they are trying to strengthen entrepreneurship so the entrepreneurs that are within the dispersed areas trying to strengthen them and make them stronger and more um, able to you know compete against the 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 more established ones in Belito while decreasing unemployment because um, I think within they've had now three uh, uh, sessions or competitions now and the last one created out of the from the top 10 entrepreneurs that they identified um, those entrepreneurs created 40 businesses within 40 new employments, right, amongst the 10 of them within the period that they were in. So let's just give them a year. Within a year, they've created 40, and that's within one chamber situation. Um, the partnerships, they're creating that. Platform for business linkages, yes. Creating platforms for traditionally disadvantaged areas to gain access to a high in corporate structures and Ilambe. We call that? Understood, right? Okay. Um, another case study is Huleman. Um, now, we work with a woman who runs the, the business support uh, center in Peter Maritzburg where Huleman currently um, is situated. Now, Huleman is one of the leading manufacturers in South Africa and they are a semi fabric alumina. Uh, aluminium um, manufacturer, right? So what Huleman did was um, they identified the need for, um, because they took a lot of the, the, the economic activity of, of Peter Maritzburg, I mean, they accounted to it. They thought, okay, let's do things differently. Let's identify a unit where we would be able to get people, so as opposed to having an in-house in plumber or having an in-house um, electrician, let's have a structure that houses a whole variety of different people who can be trained um, under Huleman, um, you know, processes and all of that, but can be just placed within a unit where they won't be access accessible to only us as Huleman, but to anyone else within the region. So what that's what they've done, and it's actually worked very well. I'm trying not to say too much, but uh, yes. So currently the BSC um, has, it was 36 companies under it, which Huleman taps into. So 
it would be a case where they'd have probably five electrician companies and five, uh, you know, cleaning companies and so on. But the strategy is amazing. Um, yeah. Okay. I won't say much. I won't say much. Okay. Um, and my third case study <laughs> is um, an organization called Men on the Side of the Road. Okay, now I have to explain this. In South Africa, because of the uh, unemployment rate, um, the high unemployment rate, what happens is in most cities, you know, like the, the CBDs of um, existing within KZN, you'll find on a random day, um, at an intersection, a robot intersection, you'll find about 10 men standing from the morning, right? Just standing there. Some will have a, a placard saying painter. Some will have a placard saying plumber, you know. Um, and if they're lucky, they'll have a truck, uh, a, a truck, uh, not even a truck, or some business person stopping and collecting maybe 10 of them for that particular day. Right now, a guy, a businessman from Cape Town, Charles Maisel, who we've worked with, who's an in, he's a, an innovation um, junkie. He's just an amazing guy who's done a lot of um, innovative strategizing for um, you know some of our government institutions and so much. But nonetheless, he identified within his his business. He has a, a development and innovation business, right already. But he wanted to extend this because he saw the major need for this particular sector to be given the attention it needed. So what he did was um, identified, okay, so these guys do this every single morning, hoping to get picked up, right? Up until about three o'clock. You will start seeing them disperse from about three o'clock because by three o'clock, if you haven't been picked up by anyone, you're not going to be picked up by anyone at all for that day and you'll leave. So wherever you've been from, or wherever you've come from, you may just end up going home without um, a job for the day. So what Charles did was he identified this need and said, these guys need to be trained so they won't just be picked up by their plug card, but they'll have a, a house or like a, a hub where they can get to in the morning. And as opposed to standing on the side of the road, they'll have a point where people can just pick them up from, right? So that was the first year of his, um, of his idea. And then he thought, wait, these people are coming here in the mornings. Let me do something with them. Let me get training going on with them so they can actually have something to say. Okay, well, I've actually been trained as a, a painter. I've been trained as a so-and-so, right? Um, now, this particular concept has been amazing. So it started in Cape Town um, and he had, uh, he, he had the one unit and today, I think, I'm trying to remember what year it was. I think it was 2010 where he started it. And now he has uh, men on the side of the road, uh, Fundi um, unit. He has units in Cape Town, Durban, and Johannesburg with not less than five in each of those, right? So it's growing and it's effective. Um, he's training these guys, so he's not just giving them a place to be picked up from as opposed to being waiting on the <laughs> side of the road but he's training these guys and he's putting them at a level where they can actually compete with um, high-end plumbers and high-end um, you know all these construction uh, specialties yeah don't want to say much oh yeah <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Cool. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Nolwazi. Um, Stan, did you want to add anything to what they've said before uh, we we open up for questions and things? Oh, you've got. You've. Are you wired? Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm sure you're feeling a little bit uh, stiff and all that by now, so I'll try and keep it sharp. But I just want to go back to the 1970s and 1980s in, in South Africa, which was a time when there was a growing international resistance to apartheid uh, as, the, as the official policy of the, of the nationalist uh, party of the time. Um, 
I remember um, Sharpville was, was an event that happened in our country, which some of you might have heard about. Uh, it's a little bit early for me, but 1976, the student uprisings in South Africa, when there was uh, the, the, the sign, very strong signs of internal resistance to the, to the nationalist government. Um, with the, the growing uh, policy at that time from the international community was uh, sanctions, and so we, we very briefly move up to, to, to 1990 um, when we, we saw very significant change starting to happen. Um, at the same time as the as very significant changes in the world, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the coming apart of the, of the communist uh, bloc and all the rest of it, a lot of significant changes in the world, also a very significant time in South Africa um, with the... Uh, movement towards the release of Nelson Mandela and the reconstruction of the country. Um, now, where I want to pick up on is some of the institutional issues um, in the background to the picture that, uh, that we've been, been hearing about. Um, and that is that obviously up until the, the late uh, 80s, South Africa was a country known for things like job reservation, where uh, black South Africans were not allowed to go into the professions, for example, other than, for example, some of the caring professions in terms of nursing and, and, and so on. But that was very much a case of separation and development, uh, what they called sep uh, a separate development, which was a very uh, a way of trying to pretend that you could have two countries sharing one area and that you could have different value systems and you could the dominant uh, group could treat the others at, as, they, as they liked, and obviously it was a time of incredible cruelty and oppression in our country. Um, during that time, as sanctions bit, the Americans in particular um, took a very strong stance on, country, uh, on companies that stayed working in South Africa. And we had what, the, what, what, was, what was at that time called the Sullivan Signatories, which were American companies which institutionally, collectively, refused to follow the rules of the apartheid regime. And so what they did was they started changing the American companies in South Africa. Many country, uh, companies are they excluded, uh, were excluded and they left the country. One of the companies, and this is one where, where, where my story begins in terms of, of, the, uh, of working with business, was uh, Shell Oil which decided to remain in South Africa, but to take a very aggressive stance towards the government of the time. And so I, I worked in the Shell Science and Maths Resource Center Education Trust, which was a very in-your-face NGO, which said that in the t terms of the way things are working in South Africa, black kids are excluded from science, maths, and engineering. And so the project was designed to work with uh, science, maths, and engineering as the focus, working with uh, teachers and with kids in the communities which were excluded by the form of education system we had. So what I want you to see there is that business was divided. There was that business which was linked totally, uh, very closely to the state, which was supported by the, by the state. There was that business which was being under extreme pressure from the international community to move out of South Africa and there were other companies that said we're going to stay and try and make a difference. So there you see business taking different stances in relation to how they were going to work with a, a country which was at that stage called an international pariah. Um, come the 1990-1994s, we have the very significant, very rapid shift in South Africa to 1994 and an apartheid government. That intervening period of time, 90 to 94, was a very interesting time for business because business saw the change, it preempted the change, and so there was a lot of movement by business to work with the ANC in exile. And so, for example, in, in, in Zambia, in other parts of, of, of Southern Africa, there was delegations of South African businessmen meeting with people in the ANC in, in, um, in who, who, were, who were outside of the country. Came the 1990s, 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 a lot of uh, exiles from our country coming back, um, a lot of fervent within South Africa for business to reconstitute its approach to change. 
Okay? So what I want you to notice is the adaptiveness of business to political change. Um, and reconstructing the way it was approaching its relationships, both with government and with communities. Because during that intervening time, the 1990s to 1990, 1994, was probably the heyday of NGOs in South Africa. And there was NGOs virtually in every kind of uh, aspect of South African life. There were thousands of NGOs. Many of them w uh, existed under the umbrella of universities because our liberal universities at that time created environments where the South African secret police found it rather difficult to, to come. And I mean, university campuses were raided by the, by the South African security police. Students were apprehended. Um, a lot of people at that, at that stage had to, males in particular, had to go into military training. A lot of young South Africans who were uh, white South Africans, to use that language, left the country because of, of dis be disagreeing with what the policies were. So a lot of people, uh, a bit younger than me, would have had to do two years military service. And that military service was protecting the outer borders of the South African regime in areas of, of, of Namibia, um, into, into the Sutu, Swaziland, Mozambique, and so on, and so protect, sort of pr providing a protection for the South African state. With the coming of 94, business now could openly declare its, uh, its desire to work with a new state. And so we found that at that stage, the, the development of new trusts, new co collaborations of business, for one of them, just to give a quick example, it was the Joint Education Trust. And the whole idea was to utilize the strengths that the NGO movement had, had developed to infuse into the, into the emerging new systems. And so the whole idea was to try and be catalytic in the, in the change within, within government in South Africa. So we had a very significant change in the attitude of business towards uh, government in trying to make it very clear that business was on side and wanting to work with in facing the challenges of, of the country. Now, obviously, we've got to understand the political makeup of the what is called the tripartite alliance who are who are the most important political affiliation group in south africa it's an affiliation group anchored in the african national congress it includes the um, communist party so a lot of our top officials are also members of the communist party mercedes driving members of the uh, communist party of course um, uh, Gucci suits and all the rest of it, but that's the kind of uh, com uh, communist party we have today. Um, and the labor unions, some of the most powerful labor unions, are part of that tripartite alliance. And that has existed, uh, came into being as part of the way government was structured uh, in, in the 19, uh, uh, 1994 and so on, and has gone on until until now. It has not necessarily been an easy marriage, but what, what, is there such a thing as an easy marriage? And, um, and so we've seen within the tripartite alliance there's been a lot of tensions, and a lot of those tensions are actually a pretty much a, a breaking point at this particular time. Different policies by government from then onwards, we had what was called the Reconstruction and Development Program, which is a very pro-socialist approach to, to political change that moved on from, from there to other policies under the uh, sort of the, what was called gear, which was very much a neo-capitalist approach to and, and sort of the liberalization of our economy and so on, which came after that. Um, and movements towards trying to get the economy to do the work of creating an inclusive society. Um, where we've moved to now, in the last uh, four years, we've had the development of what is now called the National Development Plan. And they've developed a very comprehensive 20 to 30 year plan, which takes into account all of the injustices and inefficiencies of our society, showing against the timeline um, what needs to be done where, 
and again, it is a, it's a, it's, it's a government-driven plan where now the, the, uh, the emphasis at the moment is to try and get the co-option of labor and, and business. And so it's, it's, it's a very ambivalent time. and very, um, uh, there's, there's a lot of ambiguity around people's thinking about to what extent business are gonna, is going to buy into this national development plan. Everybody says it's a great idea that we've got to have these national goals and all the rest of it. But where in the world has national plans really worked um, without them being used very flexibly and so on? I just want to step back another little... Uh, sort of picture coming into South Africa, our growing link with um, the BRICS community, our movement away from being uh, very influenced by America and Europe, although those are still, our, still very, very important business partners, to now becoming part of BRIC, BRICS. So Brazil, India, China, Russia, Russia and we little South Africa. When you, when you look at it, it doesn't make sense, but the logic is that South Africa is part of Africa, and therefore we, we like in South Africa to talk about this notion of being a gateway to Africa. Um, the, the message is coming very, uh, very loud and clear from some of our, our neighbors, or, or, or it's in, in more in the central African area. Um, just don't take that position for granted. There's Kenya and there's Nigeria, both who can equally service the southern part of Africa, and uh, they are also growing economies as well. So what's interesting is that when we looked um, at some of the, the pictures, for example, you saw in Time magazine 10, 12 years ago, it was about Africa, this land of no hope, to now Africa, the rising giant. And the markets of Africa now becoming very open to, uh, to, the, to, to international trade. So the, the big picture is one where there has been profound change. Um, and business has had to adapt very much to the development agenda and the political agenda within, within the country. Um, and I want to just pick up on some of the internal policies which have affected this. Um, the area that we're working with predominantly is in the area of local economic development. And local economic development very simply is to say that the, re the results of, the, of our history has left our country where you, if you look at South Africa from the air, you still see the geography of apartheid reflected. Indian communities, black communities, white communities, all in juxtaposition to where, where manufacturing and so on is taking place. The, the change and to, and of, the, of the, emer the emerging and, and, and the development of new areas obviously is a slow process. And when you think of 94 to 2014 next year when we have our next election, it's only a 20-year period. And 20 years might sound a long time especially if you're five. 20 years when you're 60 is a very much shorter period of time when you think about the change that human beings can go through in a, in a, in a period of time. Um, and so we have, we have seen very significant change being driven by policy. Um, the local economic development policy is saying that if we want to work and live in a globalized village, We've got to find ways of creating inclusive economies at all levels. And that's the kind of stuff that was reflected here when you looked at uh, saying 14 new people and draw, drawn into businesses, 14 new businesses. That is very significant when you're talking into, into communities where most of the income is coming from social grants. We, we are a country that we've got a very interesting balance between the number of taxpayers and the number of those who are receiving grants, either as pensioners or child grants. Uh, and so we, we do have a, a, a very broad and rather thin welfare net in South Africa, which wasn't there uh, 20 years ago, that now the, the, the broad-based 
community which, is, uh, which suffers from a lot of poverty has a very limited amount of money coming in through grants. But when you look at the numbers coming in from grants and, 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 the, and the, the amount of being spent on grants is against the number of taxpayers, you've got quite a, a, a fine line that, that you're dealing with. So the, the importance of job creation is very high on the South African agenda. And obviously, it's very contested. Who creates jobs? Can government create jobs? It's, it's not a yes or no answer. Yes, government can create jobs in the sense that people can have work and get a salary, but the, the, the money that is being paid to civil servants is always the consequence of what, what taxpayers are paying, and the predominant taxes are coming from your industry, your commerce, uh, who, who therefore are the real generators of jobs. So how do you move a country so that your, your business can significantly increase the number of jobs? Now, what we know about business is they want greater efficiencies, less people, more mechanization, more profit to the top. So that's the kind of dilemma you're dealing with. There's very powerful policies that are being put in place for each region, each district, and we've got three levels of government, local government, regional government, national government. The, the pressure is on local government to work with the other two levels to create development plans which create inclusive economies. Now, that's the kind of... We, I'm not going to fill in detail. I'm just giving a, a, a macro picture here. The other thing is where, where our, our major uh, businesses... Uh, I'm, I'm going to use an example of a mining house. I, I was asked to go and visit a couple of years ago in a pla place called Hotezel. And it was as hot as hell. Um, it was up in the, uh, in, in, in the north of the, of the, of the Cape province, um, a, a mining area. And what our, our, all of our industries, all of our commercial ventures have got to do now is create charters. And the charter is a quasi-voluntary uh, policy framework which deals with the issues that need to be dealt with in terms of creating inclusive economies. And so what they've got to do, for example, if it's, a, if it's a mining community, they've got to have a strategic plan in place that when the resources become too difficult to extract, that community will not be just deserted, but they have created a secondary economy around, around that. So... Um, Business has had to change to accommodate political change. It has had to change to accommodate the realization that we need inclusive economies. At the same time, as we've seen a whole movement within the, the world of the impact that globalization has on, 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 um, on local economies, where we, we see, for example, the whole electronics industry being so situated in China that, it's, that no one else can compete with them uh, in terms of our electronics. We've, got to, we, we've, we've come to an, economy, uh, for, to an e economics now where we obviously have not only to speak about our competitive advantage, but our comparative advantage. And um, I think the, the, the emerging theme that I'm seeing is moving beyond your comparative to your collaborative advantage. And therefore, a lot of the thinking that, that, that we are seeing em emerging is how to work with your, your uh, supply chains because the supply chains are really the form of infrastructure where um, not only are businesses thinking in terms of how we can um, maximize our, our efficiencies, but also where the issues around our, our, our human good and the human good we can do is being brought uh, far more clearly into the open through fair trade agreements and that, and that kind of thing. Um, and so the inclusion in, um, in your, your global supply chains is becoming a, a very significant issue. And that is where our, our thinking and the work we are doing is moving more and more to thinking about how regional economies are constructed. Because regional, economy, uh, 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 regional economies are the densification 
of your supply chain issues and, your, and bringing things together like that. Where does that leave South African business today? Um, I think that is a very interesting question. Um, I'm moving from a university uh, at the moment and, and going to be working for the uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And one of the, uh, just one of the documents I brought with me is this, is, this, is this document, a business vision for the economic development of Durban. And in that vision, you will see how business in an organized way is creating a more inclusive understanding of the importance of business taking a very significant role in energizing the issues that are going to create broad-based wealth for a community. And by wealth, I don't mean the 1090 wealth that we, we know in the world today, 10% of the people having 90% of the world's resources. Um, but how to create inclusive economies where people can have a life that is meaningful um, within the context of, of an economy which is, which is functional. So I think we're seeing very, very significant challenges in, in how to go about broadening the base of e economic inclusion, working from the assumption that unless we build our small business base, unless we get more people entrepreneurship and the orientation, we don't stand much chance. And so there is a very, very strong emphasis on how do we go about um, bringing about that kind of change. Um, have I got two more minutes? Two more minutes. I just want to um, talk about the project we're part of, and I just want to use this... Um, this folder because we've it's, what we did was we were trying to be clever and, 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 and sort of summarized our projects in this folder as well. Um, the project we're working with is one where we're working with the provincial government in terms of the Department of Local Economic Development and, and uh, Tourism. What they have done is each district in South Africa and in, in South Africa and in the province we're working in has got staff who are dedicated to local economic development. And the, the unit that we are part of, our dominant job, our main job, is training local economic development officials in terms of what it means to be a professional in the local economic development field. So what we've been doing is we've been trying to articulate a new profession. And at the same time training, and we're bringing in about 40 to 50 new entrants every year in this program, either doing a master's or a postgraduate diploma, where we're trying to bring together basic, basic, a basic understanding of economics, as well as a basic understanding of uh, development, and facilitating their understanding of economic geography. And that those are maybe the, the, the main issues, but obviously to do that, we've got to contextualize it in policy. So that's the kind of work we're doing, that's our dominant work. But in order to extend that work and make it more meaningful, we've got our young researchers who um, BK and Olwazi have been talking about, which are people who've done a variety of different degrees, but have come together in a very similar kind of situation to yourselves, coming together for, for nine months to a year. Uh, not as structured as your program, but we, we're looking at how to better structure it, um, where they are, are looking at core issues. Um, so, for example, one of, the, one of my students is looking at uh, the way we've created economic zones. So we've, we're saying that we've got to create spaces where we're going to really push for, for, for development. And we got, what, what, will, what will attract people, what will, especially foreign direct investment, into areas? What have you got to do to make them attractive? So that, that kind of thing. We're also pushing very hard on different regions having different enterprise zones where they are focusing on a particular kind of industry or, or a particular kind of strength. You've, you've heard of Elembe. One of theirs is um, agri-processing. And, and so how we can really build different comp uh, competencies into different districts to really push for those, uh, those, those areas to, to develop. Um, we're also working with a group who we're calling 
social entrepreneurs, and we were mentioned was made of that as well. It's people in the community who are already making a difference, creating a platform for them to work together, and out of their work to create new learning, which we can then share into that, that broader community. Um, we're trying to document our, our work in the form of a, of a journal, um, which, which, and then we're also running winter schools where we're bringing in a whole variety of people with, with, with different interests, looking at this whole issue of the co-construction of, of the economy where business and government is working together. So that's the kind of stuff we're doing, and that's a very broad macro picture which we could speak into uh, in, in further discussions with you guys. Okay. okay. Thank you, Stan. Okay, we, we have about 20 minutes left of the class, and I'd really like to hear from you. It's your chance to ask questions of our three speakers. Just as a quick wrap-up, I think what's been interesting is it's wonderful for us as, as the, in the IMSD community to see some of the issues we've talked about in class over the past few weeks contextualized. A lot of the things we've talked about have come out, but we're seeing them played out in particular circumstances with the South African case. And some of the things that have been interesting for me are hearing about business not just being national or regional, but also this local level activity. The idea of agriculture and business, as well as industry, urban ideas of business. The rural element, I think, is important. Entrepreneurship, small, medium, micro enterprises, and this idea of inclusion, this idea that we talked about yesterday of business being having a social element and it being about inclusion. I think these areas have been beautifully covered by our speakers. And before we wrap up um, at the end of today, I'd like to ask you what kind of questions you have, comments on what they've said, and if you'd like to focus in on some of the issues that they brought out. So I open the floor to you. Anna, I think you have to speak through the microphone. You can either speak loudly or you can s use this little microphone. You have to turn it on. That might help. That might help. Okay, okay. I've got it. There you go. Okay, and there we go. <laughs> uh, BK, I just wanted to ask you, what happens after you conduct the research? You said the government's involved in these projects. Are they then in charge of implementing the ideas you find, or are you also involved in changing these aspects or just finding the information for them? Um, what I've done is uh, I've just Stan is actually my boss's supervisor. And um, what okay. we've done is Sorry, can you speak oh, into that? Yes. What we've done is um, I've, I've given like just after I've done my, my whole research and all of that. I had a couple of the government people just trying to understand how far was the research and what you know what came out of it. And what I, I didn't want to just give them the findings because it still has to go through the normal academic um, processes. But what I did is I had discussions with them to say, this is what I found out and these were the thoughts. So it is those discussions and some of them are actually in our master's class. So the conversations have continued and their thinking have actually changed, which is what I was hoping to, to see happening, is that for them to start um, thinking differently and seeing community as an active agent of change within the economic development. Okay, thank you. Asya. Yeah, can you pass it around? Thank you. Okay. Um, I have, I suppose, a preliminary question. Um, I know in East Africa, um, the Asians are, are a huge part of the business community. And I was wondering if it's a similar situation uh, in South Africa. Yes. Um, and does, do you think, sorry, we talked a lot about blacks and whites because that was the biggest issue of apartheid. But I was just wondering where you feel these Asian businessmen come in because they do generally speaking, I don't know, hold, maybe hold a, an economic or political position because of their, their, their word, participation in the business sphere. I don't know who, any assistant. I, I think it's a very good question. Um, 
in that, um, to, to put it very bluntly, the Indian community in the past was seen as being too black, and now they're seen as being too white. And because we've got this passion about quotas and numbers, that we, 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 we're working not about what people can do, but we, we're judging people more still, unfortunately, in relation to their, their background and their, their, their race. However, I think the, the, there's a lot of progressive business in, in South Africa which is being led by uh, businessmen of Indian descent. And as, as you probably know, the ANC as an organization was also an, an organization which was very inclusive of very forward-thinking people of Asian descent. So it's a difficult question um, in that there is a feeling, in, in particularly in our area in Durban, which has got the biggest... Indian community outside of, of India itself, that there is certain policies which exclude them. And, I mean, just to add, um, the social reality of it all is that um, what Sam is saying, they, these Asian communities that are coming in and bringing their businesses into um, the South African context, in the townships and so on, um, what happens is people within those areas tend to um, want to I don't, I don't know how to put it in a, in, in a I'm thinking about it in Zulu but like, they, don't, they don't like it, they don't like the one um, they see it as taking the business opportunities right? whereas in reality if they were going to take that opportunity they would have done it a while back right? so you'll get situations like um, people within that locality um, shunning these uh, the these guys coming in, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's just a, a complex situation, but government can't do much about it because there's a bigger picture to it all. That foreign direct um, you know, investment, these people have been called in by our government and given a place to come and trade or work here, but the understanding on the ground is not you know, on par, at par. So, <coughs> again. Um, also, what we're seeing is in rural areas, that's where you, 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 you're supposed to see local business. It's like small shops owned by local people. And what's happening now, we're having um, people from nationals from Pakistan um, coming into the rural areas, taking over those little shops, and which is now, if you've seen in the news, I mean, what has happened now, we've had a lot of demonstrations and a lot of um, people just... Um, burning down the shops owned by the Pakistanis and there's whole attacks of xenophobic attacks because of that the local people finding that the Asian you know, communities are coming into the, um, the very rural communities and taking over the little you know, the shops that are owned by a local person so okay, thank you Guyo, you had a question yeah. uh, um, I have a question for Nolwazi mm -hmm. I and I found very interesting the example, the case study of Ula, Ulami. Yes. And um, so the fact that they were, uh, they started outsourcing some of their internal services mm -hmm. in order to also favor the community and uh, decrease unemployment. And as I have heard of other examples of other like companies, of well, actually multinational companies that in Asia or in um, Latin America had um, similar uh, effects on the communities, but they were driven like the objective was for them was to increase pro um, the profit, and uh, so the social benefits were actually kind of side effects for them. In the, the case of Ulamin, mean, were they uh, what was the main objective like profit or like a kind of philanthropy and the social objective? Okay. Um, so background there was initially it was uh, initially it fell under the CSI, CSR right CSI CS, um, corporate social yeah. responsibility and what they would do is um, each year they would pick five different um, service providers to come and or, or were given basically um, some sort of a like a, a tender, an internal tender to, to do particular things and go through training and somewhat. And that particular business could bring in um, 
some of their staff to come get trained, right? So again, they go away with a, a Huleman service provision um, that they can take anywhere else. And then they flip that after those five years and said, let's just start a whole entire um, unit. So in a sense, it did start off as um, just giving back and, and, and ticking that box off. Oh yeah, we've given back to the social um, you know, needs that we need to tick off. But it, I think, yes, it did go um, to a point where they understood that this was doing great for their profits, right? And in doing so, because, um, I know I can put, it, put this, but um, they didn't need to pay someone monthly in, internally, right? Right, because they put, they literally took about 90% of the internal services to this particular um, place. And now, but the sad part, you know, the reality of it all was that they started um, retrenching people and giving them that option to go to the business support center, right? Um, not everyone's going to make it. Not everyone's going to be able to start a business as they've been taken out there. So, yeah, it did get a bit, um, messy in some points. So the the whole idea, the the context, the concept was there, right? But I don't think it fell through totally um, in 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 a positive, you know, image for society. I mean, but if at the end of the day, not a lot of people are doing that. Not a lot of corporates are doing that. So it's one of those. Any other questions, Gabriella? Can where I just see my yeah. Um, I have a question for you, and I'm interested also in working with communities. Um, and my my country is um, real uh, similar to South Africa, like with a lot of corruption, a lot of rural areas. And how do you feel like working with them? At the beginning, it was hard. To, I mean, um, because they are like uh, afraid of people that ask questions and then you write it down and they are asking, what are you writing down? And my question is, do you feel at the beginning, like the steps, the beginning, during the, the, the trust thing at, at the end of all the, your project? Um. As I said before, I, uh, what I did is I, I changed my method of, of collecting my data. So I didn't use interviews. So it wasn't like a one-on-one. -on -one. So it was more of a conversation. So it was more of chatting, literally chatting to them. So tell me what's your business. What I found is as human beings, we love to, for someone to, 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 for myself, to tell someone else about what I'm doing. So we love to tell someone about myself, what are my projects and all of that. So I took that. Um, yes, at first going into the community was hard. I was a stranger. Um, I looked different, I dressed different. Um, my first day was a bit hard. I had to go back, rethink and, re and, and strategize. Had to dress differently. Didn't have to wear fancy stuff. Had to take local taxi. Because the first time I went there, I, I borrowed a car from a friend. So I came in in a car. So all of that, you, you, that's why I said, the context where you're going to, you need to start understanding. And what I did is, as a researcher, I forgot to put my research cap when I'm going to the community because I first needed to make, I mean, first do research of the community that I'm going to and understand their way of life, understand, you know, and something which is quite often that we don't usually do is trying and understand the community that you're going into. So, like, small things. I had to wear a skirt. I couldn't wear pants. And I know in some parts sounds, you know, it's... What's the difference? But as a woman in Africa, there's certain parts of Africa where you cannot wear pants and address people. You cannot do that. You cannot stand in front of people and wear pants or show you know, a bit of flash and all of that. So I had to dress differently. It is something small, but going into that community was vital. I had to dress differently. Some of them it was okay, but in some areas I had to, you know, there's certain things that I had to do. So 
for me, what I did is, is trying to understand the community that I'm going into, what they like, and also the language. Couldn't speak English, so I had to speak Zulu. Um, and some words, because I speak Swati, which is similar to Zulu, so in some words, um, they could pick up. And that also sprang up conversation. Oh, you Swati, eh? Then they started going <laughs> on and on about how they knew the king. <laughs> you know, and asked me, do I know some relative of theirs? I'm like, well, Swaziland, it, makes, it is a big country, so I don't know everyone. So also that um, kind of gave me that, um, that hand, you know, that fist hand to say, okay. And I felt like a local. The second time I went there, my second day was amazing. Like... And writing, and I explained to them, I said, listen, I'm doing research. I want to hear your story. I want you to tell me. But in order for me to be able to be able to tell someone else your story, I need to write it down. And I need to record you. And it's not purpose of trying to use this information and to make your life, you know, different from what it is. But it's just for me to understand and understand your business, your context, and who you are within the context that you're working in. Thank you. And just to add, sorry, Lisa, like, um, to add on that, oh, sorry. some of the most difficult parts about doing research in situations like BK is talking about is, yes, the language, but also just getting that perception that, hold up, I'm here to help you, but I'm not going to give you assistance now, right? Because we have this very big dependency syndrome that just lacks around um, the rural areas. They, they see someone who is coming to ask them uh, questions about their challenges and their situations. And once you get that trust and these people just talk to you, you have to also hold up tell me these things and I'll help you get the help you need, right? It's just so much. And another thing is like, when we're doing the research, um, when we're at school, we have to, we draft and write our whole thesis in English, right? So the questions we design are in English. But when we get to these communities and we're, we need to ask these questions to people who don't even speak English, you now have to now try and change it all and approach that particular question in that particular language and get every single point that you want out of it. It's just some of the challenges that most of our young researchers have been facing, um, which is an interesting... <laughs> it's, it's really good for us to hear this because we actually talked about it on the first day when we talked about research work. Yeah. And for us, it's all about ethics as well, the ethics of being a researcher and how far you engage and this idea of action research that you, you can't do it objectively. You're going to make a difference. You're going to have an impact. Recognize that and work with it as well. So I think this is really useful for, for everybody. Any more, any more final? Oh, okay. Selena, you have the thing, and then Yvonne, okay? So, uh, I wanted to ask because I found very interesting the social capital research that you were doing. Uh, and I, um, we are talking a lot about developing, development and, and different experiences, and lots of them are in local or rural, rural areas, like we talk about uh, local communities. Do you think that your research might be applied to a city? Uh, how, how do you think like this social capital concept can be uh, thought in a city? Because it's like so much complex, and, but it's like where a lot of people are, and also there are a lot of challenges, uh, as, as also um, uh, in the other presentation, uh, there are a lot of challenges of poverty and uh, of uh, development. So. I, what do you think about that? Looking at where it comes from, it, it, it actually was, it's more implemented at an urban setting. So it was hard trying to implement it at a local setting and a more of a rural setting because it's hard for, it's, I would think from what I saw was that at a more urban area when you start talking about trust, people, people kind of, move a step ahead and say, okay, yeah, I can trust you because they know the end result, the end goal and what they want to get to. But at rural areas, they still believe so much in respect than, you know, trust. So for me, trying to 
take social capital into the rural areas coming from an urban setting was quite um, difficult but I think it applies it can apply in both settings because it's all about the engagement and building networks and relationships um, which can happen anyway and I think it is more can be more used in, in a rural setting because that's where we want to 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 create development, I mean, to make development happen. That's where we want dev to see development at more at a rural setting because the urban se se um, areas have been, the focus has been given onto them. So now we need to try and shift into more of a, trying to bring rural to, this, to the position where we think, okay, development is existing. We can see it and we can, you know, we can pinpoint and say, okay, this is where development is, is happening. So. In terms of social capital, I believe that it can um, be practiced in both settings. In actual fact, the, the European Union has done a lot on that. The, the idea of social capital being um, some, a concept that we should use across all, all aspects of society. And this has really become intrinsic to the way, for example, the European Social Fund is working. So it's a very good question, and I think good to bring that out. Yvonne. Uh, and Lassie was talking about business are trying to help to tackle some problems like inequality, poverty and unemployment. But you also mentioned corruption. So are, is there something going on to tackle this problem? Because like you said, it's about respect or trust. You need to gain trust because you talk about uh, corruption in the three, th se uh, three sectors, business, government and society. So how can you work? If there's no trouble. There was a speaker, sorry, <laughs> so I can <laughs> That's exactly that. Um, and, and that's part of the reasons why we aren't achieving the development that we possibly could as a country. Um, and I mean, something that could be off topic, but what the government tried to do um, was to, in, in, in trying to get people to be more, and in particular, the uh, BK touched about, um, on BEE, which is um, broad black, uh, broad based black economic empowerment, which is mainly to try to get the, the black people who were disadvantaged, and I put that in red commas, disadvantaged priorly, um, an opportunity to engage in or, or be part of the economic um, activity within um, the country. So what they did was, um, went through an approach where government tenders, so whether it was um, fixing up a, a, a national road or fixing up a hospital or, you know, t government tenders, giving those, um, giving first preference to, um, well, being a, a black female, I would be giving first preference, um, second would be a black male, and then uh, along those lines, based on, there's, there's a, a whole chart um, that you can Google on the BE ranks. Um, and what happened was with that is um, now they were getting these opportunities, right? So you'd get a tender and you'd be given about a million rand to fix up a, a, a road, right? Now, what happened before was they'd give you that million rand and you'd have to do that particular road within a certain amount of time. Now, because that's like so much money and if you think about it, these people ha weren't exposed to such large amounts of money and having to deal with and uh, with all these particular, you know, situations and development processes that a lot of them were trying to bribe their ways into getting these options, uh, these tenders. So um, I'd know BK who happens to sign off who gets the tender, right? So I'd pay BK 10% of the tender. I'd we'd, we'd have an arrangement of paying 10% of that tender um, just so that I can get it and I can get the money, right? So that's corruption number one. And then, so that's my, as a civil, uh, civil society person, being corrupt and approaching um, a local government per a person and them being corrupt and it's infiltrated throughout that whole um, process. So you can see the development of that. The road won't, and oh, and another thing is the road probably won't even be done because they've tiled half the money, right, before it's even been done. Um, although now they've adapted to it, so you have to do the work before you get paid. It's different, but corruption's still there. They still find a way. So I mean, it's it's small things like that 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 hinder the process. And again, um, 
You mentioned something else? You mentioned... Uh, I wanted to... Oh, uh, man. Yeah, the plan. The plan. Oh. Okay, yes. So what, what they've done is um, uh, our president has rolled out a national development plan, right? That's made to be the, the answer to all development problems and challenges in South Africa. <laughs> and, I mean, it's, they're on the right track, but it's, it's still not accurate because there's so many loose ends within the corruption and the, the just the inequality of it all like how like screening someone before you can even give them the money like how much do you know of that person's economic background and then you give them a 20,000 rand um you know job i mean this person's never handled anything more than 10,000 rand in their account probably um, and now you're giving them something of that and you're not even training them or capacitating them to actually be able to process it, right? But the National Development Plan is, is, is heading towards that, the, the new and revised one. So let's check it out because they've been punting it out lately as the way and the solution. So ask us again in about <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Maybe it's very quickly, last quick. What we've got, we can, we can actually carry on because we have a class after the break. I'm just conscious of time. So is it a quick question? Okay, let's take one last question and then we'll carry on after the break. Um, I think, Bika, you touched on the, um, the research base about some team doing some research about during your presentation. I want to find out that when these people finish their research, do they give, when they give it to the government, is it really going to implement it or they will sell their research resource to entrepreneurs? What we're hoping to do, um, what we're hoping to do is, is to give it because this is a funded program by government. Um, as I've said, that is a partnership between the university and the provincial government. So the research that they're doing is part of their master's research. So what we're hoping to do is, is for them to give it back for implementation. But we all know that, I mean, research, so much research is done. So much papers are, uh, are taken out, and all of that implementation it's either going to take about 10 years or it's either going to take one month. So we always hope that what we've given, you know, government or an NGO or a civil society or business, we always hope that it will actually be implemented. We've made recommendations. We've said, okay, this is how we're seeing this change and this is how the plan is going to be. But as Noloazi said, we have a national development plan. We don't know how it's going to plan out, but we hope that it will be utilized. Yeah. And I think we're also feeding it into a community of practitioners, which I think is quite important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's actually quite a nice note to end on. Just a couple of things then. First of all, thank you, BK, for bringing in the idea of social capital, because I think it is absolutely essential to, to the, the, the sustainable development course that we're involved in. And I think you positioned it in such a way that it brings in this whole area of inclusion and uh, participation, empowerment, some of the concepts we've been looking at. You've positioned it beautifully, and I think it tying it in with our class yesterday, it's the idea of all parties, groups, institutions, sectors of society need to be participating. And those boundary areas we talked about yesterday are crucial to that. So, I, I mean, I think that's a very nice kind of conclusion to, to the discussion, so thank you. And then on a, on a personal note to all three of you, thank you, Stan, for setting the scene and giving us the historical context. I think that was really helpful. Um, Normalazi, thank you for the, uh, ch the challenges, beautifully set out, and both of you for bringing in your personal stories. I think that really makes all the difference when you're in these kind of academic environments, hearing real life stories, and you hearing about the process of engaging in communities is really important for us. And Mavis's question is great to end on because it is about, you're saying, how do we feed these things into practice? It is through mainstreaming. And it's not just about the product, the thing you end up with. It's about how you get there, the process. So BK's interaction with the community, this process of interaction is part of feeding it into 
the, the way that we change and learn and think. And the university is doing that because the Young Researchers Program, I think this idea of a community of practice, bringing people from different backgrounds to look at these issues is, is part of that learning. So thank you very much, um, and it's a real pleasure to have you here. <laughs>